This is Laura Fulford welcoming you to this bite-sized bio web seminar, which today is sponsored by Zeiss. With Zeiss, you can choose a scanning electron microscope for automated TEM-like 3D imaging and correlate your results with a whole portfolio of complementing techniques. The unique Zeiss portfolio for life sciences enables a whole new world of ultrastructure imaging and correlative microscopy in 3D. Today's presentation is titled 3D Electron Microscopy for Life Sciences and is being presented by Eric Hummel, a Zeiss Imaging Specialist. Eric graduated in Cell Biology at the University of Heidelberg with Professor David Robinson in 2006. Afterwards, he became Research Fellow at Oxford Brookes University in two th until 2009 when he moved back to Germany to act as a Research Counselor for the University of Beirut and in 2012, he joined product management and application support for the Zeiss Microscopy Labs in Munich. His research focus lies on correlative microscopy, electron tomography, soft X-ray microscopy, and focused iron beam imaging and workflow development. We will have a brief question and answer session after the presentation. Any additional questions will be answered in a PDF document that will be made available along with the on-demand webinar. So please type any questions that you have into the questions box, which appears on the right hand side of your screen. So now over to you, Eric, for the presentation. Thank you very much. So, yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. So I don't have to introduce myself too, too much today. First of all, about the topic of the talk today, I want to focus today on in new questions in correlative microscopy and 3D SEM techniques. So in the agenda, you, I will give you a first a short introduction about what I'm done before, what Laura already did. Then we will talk about questions leading to 3D correlative workflows. Then we will start a correlative bit. We'll turn into, in, into cryo applications for SEM. And then also we want to put an eye on analytical questions with focus IM beam and EDX. And last but not least, I will talk about a new development from, from Carl Zeiss, the um, non-destructive technique of array tomography. First of all, you've seen already what I've done before. I worked for several years in Heidelberg. And as a microscopist, I spent off introduce already my kids into the nice world of microscopy. You're seeing here my little daughter and my son helping me with acquiring 3D data sets for our webinar today. Um, and I'm with I si since 2012 and yeah, mainly, mainly working on workflow development for these new intriguing techniques. First, as a short introduction slide, this is what you all might know from classical SEM microscopy. Topographic images of different organelles, in this case for plankton samples, and you also have an idea about 3D, already about correlative microscopy with shuttle and find, where we can also co-localize in this example particles, um, fluorescent nanobeads, with the structure of topographic cells, in this case macrophages. Not many people know already what are the other possibilities of SEM microscopy. We have here two samples, two pictures of the same sample. One is the classical TEM image. The second one is an SEM image. And I think it's not easy to decide which is which, but you see the SEM and the TEM provide really similar results in terms of resolution of ultrastructural details, as you see here in this neuromuscular junction sample of a um, mouse. I will focus here in the talk on a specific topic, the so-called focus IM beam tomography. Typical SAM imaging is based on a constant scanning of a block surface, providing information about, about the surface of, of, of the sample. With focus IM beam, you have a second column included which uses gallium ions to section very thin sections of your block surface. And every time when one section is done, the SEM scans the surface of the image. 
and you end up with a 3D tomogram of the acquired volume. In the second step, we start the visualization in 3D as a, or as a typical tomogram, and then we get a full sample of these um, cells of interest. I will start here with a workflow leading us more and more into correlative imaging. A typical example here is we have here a workflow that was done with human bladder stem cells. And as we see here, four images out of the stack, every image is two microns in set away from each other. If we look to these three images under TM conditions, you would think nothing special is in picture one, picture two, and picture four. It looks like typical Golgi's. If we look after four microns in depth, we see a very intriguing structure here. We see Golgi stacks looking connected with each other. For TM tomography, the classical approach for 3D volume generation on an electron microscope, you would need at least for the whole data set and need at least 70 sections to acquire this type of volume. And maybe, as you all might know how difficult serial section for, SE, uh, for TM imaging is, you would lose these interesting parts here. And especially you have to correlate also in all sections the structure again with a, with a starting point. If we look to the whole tomogram, we see really something intriguing. And I start now the movie, yeah. As we see here, this was a cell shortly after mitosis. And we see here that all these Golgi stacks, which are located around the nucleus, are at some, time, at some point completely interconnected with each other. So we see really a Golgi continuum of these cells. If we prepare a reconstruction of this sample, we can see a, that this continuum is really complete over the whole Golgi stacks are completely interconnected with each other at this stage of, of cell division. We all know from the di discussion about Golgi in mammalian cells that it disappears shortly before mitosis and then pops up at the end of mitosis. And here we might have, we got exactly this area where all these Golgi is rebuilt and at some point in a later time state they will um, disconnect and build single Golgi's. And these techniques, these images were taken on a crossbeam Auriga system in just 18 hours. And for TEM tomography, you would need at least 40 sections, do tomography tilt series of it. Only for the tilt series of one section, you can calculate approximately one and a half to two hours. So you can imagine how time consuming this step is without all the steps of post-processing afterwards. A second important factor, especially for size, is speed. We have many people, many scientists asking, coming from light microscopy, which are, we, which are used to fast image acquisition. So Electron microscopes are fairly new as a time-consuming method to acquire data sets. If you want to record a number of data in a short time, electron microscopy, especially TEM tomography, was not the, the topic of choice. So we said, OK, can we be <coughs> faster with, our, with the recording of our data sets? And the answer is yes. We used we try to use here for a, an, as an example um, Glamidomonas cell treated with Profeldin A, which deconstructs the Golgi. We washed the chemical out and did afterwards as a, a FIP series of one of these Golgi's. And we want to see how fast can we be that automatic segmentation algorithms can still recognize these structures and are able to segment them automatically or semi-automatically. 
and that's the resu result. We used a high image of a higher FIP current to mill, and we used a faster scanning speed. The quality, of course, is not as good as the sample we've seen before, but it is good enough for automated segmentation routines, in this case in Maris, to do a semi-automated segmentation. And what we see here, that at this early stage of Golgi biogenesis, all these cisterni seem to be interconnected, and we see quite nicely contact zones between ER and Golgi membranes. Then, again, dedicated to light microscopy. Of course, if you read the literature, you find for FIP milling, normally windows could be opened of about 40 micrometers in literature. But for many people working with light microscopy, 40 microns are not enough to illustrate their structure of interest, especially for people working with connectomics, with brain research, and everything else. So we said we have to open much larger windows in a shorter time to get also here very good results. One important factor in this case is that, of course, if you FIP mill, you use gallium ions to mill away very thin sections of your sample. That takes time. If you use higher, uh, higher, uh, larger windows, of, in this case of about 100 microns, the FIP milling time with a classical approaches is, is far too long. So you would need for a classical FIP milling with around 600 picoampere, you need for 100 um, microns, you would need at least six to eight minutes only for the milling process. So we said, okay, we adjust our FIP milling to higher currents. At the moment, we are higher than nine ano nanoampere for that and milled up to um, trenches of about 100 microns. We also managed now to get trenches with 20 nanoamps of around 150 to 200 microns. The result is that one milling of these sections is around two and a half seconds compared to several, mil several minutes. So that brings, of course, the time down to a accepting time frame. The data set you see now are around 6,000 images of a brain um, a mouse cortex um, done in around 18 hours. Oh, one second, now the movie. Okay. And the advantage of these faster milling process is that the sample is very stable during the milling. You see here the raw data set of a brain sample without doing any cross correlation. We see only a tiny, tiny jump here, but the sample is perfectly preserved, perfectly stable, and of course this opens to the door to all the different correlative questions. This was only an example in magnification, of course. You can also decide in doing tile scans here with larger magnification, but it opens definitely the to large connectomic studies, also with focus ion beam. We see here nicely all the different organelles. We see here in higher magnification all the structural details which appear during the acquisition process. And of course, later on, you are able to reconstruct complete neurons and dendritic spines, for example. All these workflows I have shown you so far lead, of course, into the next topic, the correlative microscopy. Correlative microscopy is one thing size can provide the best, yes, definitely, because we have the whole portfolio of L light microscopy and electron microscopy imaging, starting from stereo and zoom microscopes to wild fields to confocal microscopes, to super resolution systems, and our portfolio in cross-beam imaging and classical scanning electron microscopy. And as a new example, we also have a new um, 
product portfolio, the so-called X-ray microscope, which can interconnect perfectly also with our correlative systems. And of course also in the high-end portfolio with the highest resolution, um, the helium ion microscopes. A classical workflow for correlative microscopy so far was 2D imaging. We had also here with scientists, of course, interactions because we want to provide the best possible solution to answer your questions on a correlative way. Here we show one example of a collaboration with, 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 with um, Kaplan and Kirk Chimek about the localization of a new G protein which seems to be coupled to receptors in yeast. The workflow here was we did high, the, our collaborators did high pressure freezing of yeast cells expressing this G protein, which was coupled on GFP. Then a lovicryl embedding at low temperature was carried out, a immunostain with GFP antibodies after sectioning, then super resolution microscopy of the ultrasyn section was prepared and then we did a correlation with shuttle and find our correlative tool on the ELIRA system and on Whitefield system. And at the end of course the overlay of the corresponding results. Here we see the perfect example of these, of these structure. These G proteins are used to localize on the Golgi-like body in yeast. And everybody who knows yeast and worked with this know that it's a pretty small organism with pretty s small Golgi structure. We are talking about Golgi-like structures in this case. In wide field microscopy we get a clear signal but not point-like. It looks like a conglomerate of highly fluorescent um, structures. If we carry out structured illumination imaging, we see already more detailed structures within. We see point-like signals. And if we change to the storm imaging, you can see really point-like imaging of these fluorescent labeled cells. Then, using our shuttle and find tool, which is based on a position transfer from the, L, from the light microscope to the electron microscope, you can clearly co-localize the fluorescent signal with internal structures of the yeast cells. And as you see here, and of course higher mag, we see here these electron-dense structures which, which represent the Golgi-like bodies co-localizing perfectly with the fluorescent signal from the antibody. And as you all know, if you work with cells looking quite similar to each other, such as yeast, it's very difficult with a manual approach to find exactly the same cell again. And with our tool shuttle and find, it's very easy and simple and you can co-localize perfectly to the same cell um, with a stage transfer from system to system. And now we saw how can that work on 2D. We had also, of course, many, many questions on the, question, uh, on the, on, on the field. How can the same thing work in 3D with a 3D correlation purpose? What we did here was a classical approach which is fairly new in electron microscopy is the chemical fixation of adherent cells at the beginning. So you grow your cells on matic dishes for example, you image them on a light microscope, then you carry out a, a dehydration afterwards, you embed the samples with a resin, you remove the sample using liquid nitrogen or fluor fluoric acid and transfer it afterwards to the EM. And this workflow was again developed with a partner from the EMBL in, in Heidelberg which does exactly that. The, the, the group of Yannick Schwab imaged cells on the light microscopy level, they are again interested in Golgi, Golgi um, in the Golgi structures 
And afterwards, after light microscopy imaging, they did a fixation and embedding. And they used for these fixation and embedding and already for the imaging, they used so-called matic dishes with marks on it. These dishes have a very, very, um, have imprints of a, of a pattern on top. If you embed these samples and you remove the glass afterwards, you see these imprints also on the, on the resin block. And you can use these imprints as a transfer of the positions. So you mark three positions on your light microscope, then you do your light microscopy imaging, you go through your whole embedding routine, and then you use these marks for re-identification on the SEM, and you've, you mark these positions and f use the focus ion beam, the cross beam system, for exactly doing the 3D acquisition of exactly these cells. And here we have an example of, of a trench cut into these um, sample. And the result here again, here we put together everything from what we learned before. First of all, these customers are interested in rapid imaging. They first want to see if there's anything obvious to analyze. If yes, you, you can continue, of course, with higher resolution stacks. But for the first, for first idea what's inside, they want to look really roughly fast um, if there is anything interesting in these cells. And we did the whole imaging here of around nine, 929 sections in approximately five hours. And here we see the results. There's a half of a HeLa cell sectioned with a focus ion beam system. What we see here nicely, the Golgi is appearing around the nuclear structure. We see details of mitochondria coming up. And again here, the nucleus. And again around the nucleus, the Golgi-like structures. And of course, also here, we did a, a manual modeling, again, very fast, very, very roughly using simple thresholding algorithms to show is there anything interesting in these type of cells? If yes, you can, you can continue with these mutant cell lines and provide, of course, high resolution samples with higher magnification, with more structural detail, and of course, with um, higher resolution as it is here. But at the beginning, as a start point, that was a perfect, perfect sample to see if there's anything interesting. It becomes more difficult if we switch to the to tissue cells. We saw now um, single cell layers. Single cell layers are quite easy to detect, but what can we do with tissue? We have, we have one customer here, Professor Herms from the University of Munich, who is interested in the, in the structural changes of dendritic spines. And he wants to see if we can image these cells over life to the fixed state and analyze these dendritic spines. And the second step is, can we go, can we see exactly the same neuron after preparation for focus IMB milling. And that's, of course, a very tempting task to do that. Because we start from imaging in the living brain, going, to, going through fixation, vibratome sectioning, confocal imaging, and EM fixation and embedding. And then, of course, we also have to find this, the same area of interest back on the, on the focus IMB. That was a demanding job to do, but in collaboration with, with Dr. Lydia Blaskes and Professor Herms from, from the LMU in Munich, we managed quite nicely to do so. They set up a system to prepare um, brain windows in the mouse. They imaged, we're using these correlative setups, 
They imaged the same neurons over several weeks and months and analyzed the stability of the dendritic spines on these neurons. And after a period of time, they fixed these cells, perfused the animal, cut vibrosome sections out of this area. And before we section the vibratome sections, we applied using the two photon laser of the electron microscope we applied laser marks around the area of interest. Here you see our first attempts shortly up before and shortly after the area of interest. Then we rechecked, we can also we, um, improve the marks as, especially around the area of interest where the interest where the actual, actual neuron was. And then we fixed and embedded for EM and of course we can reshuttle also these laser marks again on on the electron microscope and we end up with a high resolution data set of exactly this area of interest. Here again in more detail we used several neurons here these are the neurons we, we investigated over a period of time for electron microscopy, or for the proof of principle, we used the neuron 4, which is shown here. We imaged it over several weeks. Then we did the perfusion of the brain. We did a, neck, a last image of the fixed state. We implied laser marks using the two photon laser around the neuron of interest. And we found out that we, you have to keep at least a distance of around 10 microns on each side to not burn the structure of interest where you are actually looking for. And then we carried out a typical embedding process which is used for vibratome sectioning. And the result was we could perfectly co-localize these structures back on the SEM. You see in picture one an image of six dendritic spines before perfusion in the living state. The same area after perfusion. You have to keep in mind, especially with perfusion, you always lose a bit of fluorescence and you cause um, some shrinkage of the cells. So we did always a second image of the perfused state. Then we carried out focus IMB milling using shuttle and find to re-identify the laser marks. We did a stack of in total 1,600 images and out of these we did a segmentation and you see in pictures C and D the result of the segmentation. And as a 3D model, we have the same result here. You see uh, the 3D model, you can still see the 1,600 sections which correspond to the little area we see here of the neurons 1 to 6, what we imaged for, for um, focus IMB milling. So the proof of principle was done. Yes, we can co-localize the same area of interest using our portfolio which can be a multi-photon laser or laser microdissection system to imply the laser marks and use these laser marks for correlative imaging on the SEM side. And of course, size, after, after we've done that work, we said, okay, we, we, we should automate this process a bit more and you will soon see a solution for that, which is realized in, in Atlas, in the Atlas 5 software, where you do exactly the same. Here we have the example for X-ray microscopy, but for light microscopy, it would be the same. You take an image with your light microscope or with your X-ray microscope, then this 3D stack is imported into your SEM software like a 3D shuttle and find solution. You can see an imprint of this data 
on top of your SEM block. You can align these samples perfectly and you can perfectly design where on the electron microscopy sample you have to apply your FIP stack and you also get the information how deep has this to be um, in terms of the milling depths you have to decide. That's a new software solution for it. Then of course after talking about all that we will come to a more difficult topic. And the very difficult topic here is we, we show you first data on cryo focus IM beam tomography. As you all know the best possibility to fix cells is, is high pressure freezing. High pressure freezing is so fast you can freeze your cells of interest within milliseconds without inducing typical artifacts. Artifacts would be for, for many electron microscopists for example the um, destruction of lipid bodies for example which happened during chemical fixation that you lose certain lipids. One example is the shrinkage of organelle using cryo um, folk, um, high pressure freezing you prevent the reaction of these cells because you are freezing your cells so fast that you have really a close close to native structure of the uh, um, cells of interest. In this case we've, we froze neuronal cell culture cells and we did FIP milling under cryo with refined conditions. And the result is to have a close to native state preparation without the implementation of aldehydes and um, heavy metal intrusions. And here is an example our colleague Andrea Schertl carried out in Oberkochen in collaboration with Wiebke Möbius from the MPI where you see perfectly a wonderful cryo milling through a neuron and you see we have no osmium applied at all and you see a perfectly nice structure here of Golgi stacks. You can see here on top multivesicular bodies coming up which are very difficult to fix chemically. We can start it once again to see it nicely. Here are some multivesicular bodies coming up and this is really a close to native fixation protocol and you see also the typical cryo effects what you might know from Semovi sections with the typical lines but the contrast is brilliant and of course the advantage you have with the machines from us is that you can do that because we use just the low KV imaging with only a, a one or maximum two KV which are used to do the, to achieve these results. With higher voltages of course you destroy your ice layer, you implement heat in it and of course your structure get destroyed. But in this case low KV imaging and the mix of different detector signals allow you to work also on cryo conditions. And of course the next step would be to imply that also into light microscopy and work on the correlative workflow on that. And last but not least, um, to all these correlative setups in 3D, we have also the, we forgot completely the analytical bit. We, we all know that we have also with our SEM system, you have the possibility of EDX imaging. You can image several um, metabolites and cells, heavy metals for example. And we had a very nice example with, with um, with Marek Nokun from the University of Lodz who gave us a sample which had a cell sample who, who had titanium dioxide included. And also here you want to know on a correlative way where these samples are, where these titanium particles are and you want really the quantitative proof, the qualitative and quantitative proof that it's really the heavy metal you are looking for. And what we see here is a nice example of that. We have a macrophage cell here again. We see a very nicely milled focused ion beam stack. We see here on the surroundings clearly the titanium dioxide particles. 
and we see also included particles within the cells. So we have definitely an uptake here again you see it looks like an uptake here and of course you want to have a final proof if these structures what you have included inside the cells are really the heavy metal we are we are talking about we've done again 3d reconstructions of it we see clearly conglomerates of titanium dioxide we see here also inclusions of of these titanium dioxide particles within the cell and with the EDX system we can clearly prove that these structures what you've seen before in that image on this on this area has a clear clear peak for titanium dioxide And now we have talking, we've talked a lot about focus on IMB milling. But many scientists are interested in non-destructive possibility to preserve the samples you, you sectioned. Focus IMB milling has one big disadvantage. From the moment you milled your structure of interest away, you can't relook at the same section on the same surface again. It's gone. We developed for that together with a partner. Um, we came to a new approach, the so-called array tomography. Our partner RMC developed a solution together with Harvard which allows you to, con to collect serial sections using a microtome and a so-called tape collector which is called atom tome. The auto atom tome automatically connects the sections one by one by a constant move and you can collect several hundreds to thousand sections on these on these tapes mounted afterwards for example on silicon wafers on glass slides and analyze them for microscopy. And here we have our new software solution doing that, the so-called Atlas Array Tomography. You can start on the light side doing light microscopy imaging, importing these data into the software of Atlas Array Tomography using again our correlative system, our 3D marks these three L's for example, but every other possibility, every other holder is possible. You simply need three marks to co-localize these structures again. Then you fine align it, you label your section rims, you semi-automatically transfer these section per section with a so-called stamp mode which identifies the rims of your sample. Here you see it quite nicely. Going through the whole section ribbon which could be several hundred to hundred section in a row. Here we have it again for atom tome tape. You collect here, you mount here the section ribbons and use the stamp tool to transfer it one by one to the other sections. And after doing that, you select the areas you really want to image, which you are really interested in. You can do an overview image on SEM, which is quite, quite fast to do. Then you can zoom in, in the, into these areas. You can define specific ROIs to do even higher resolution images. The workflow allows you to define pixel sizes and it automatically copies the region of interest to the restrictive area of the other section. Here you see the one by one transfer of the position. And you define the magnification, the pixel size you want to use, and then the software automatically calculates you um, the number of tiles needed 
to do the image acquisition as you see here. And you get a suggestion and then the system runs completely automated through the whole section ribbon. And on the next day you come back and you end up with a complete sample. And you can build up afterwards of course also a 3D volume doing that and you can zoom in and your sample is preserved. If you want to come back at some point, you go back to the microscope, you record the same wafer again, maybe of another structure of interest. And that's a very important topic, especially for correlative microscopy if you want to do immunolabeling or other correlative approaches, or you simply want to store your samples, like with, like in pathology, for example, where you have want to go every time again back to the to the same sample. And here we see very nicely a reconstruction out of that, so you can even build a 3D data set out of that of the same sample. This, that was a reconstruction done with a software called, called ORIAS, which is a very nice tool to serial um, tool for image analyzing and modeling. And now I'm nearly at the end of my talk and I just want to, if you want to read that all again, um, Carl Zeiss has together with the Journal of Microscopy, we will have a special issue in the Journal of Microscopy together with RMS where customers of us provided new publications on all these workflows I presented today. We have a nice article about correlative workflows LM to FIP on HIV infection for example from Hans-Georg Kreuzlich from the University of Heidelberg. We have the brain example of 3D multi-photon FIP, what you saw in our talk. We have nice focused IM beam um, Golgi preservation paper from Bram Costa and we have sample three view sample preparation papers with Chris Garin. We have the topic of array tomography which I showed you in the last bit. We have plant imaging and our newest latest technique the, the multi-beam SEM. And of course we are also interested in the aftermath, in the processing. We have also some articles in dealing with that, for example, imaging processing after acquisition, segmentation and modeling on a freeware called Elastic from Fred Hambrecht, and quantification issues for of secretory organelles, for example. And at the end I want to thank all our partners and customers who made really a great job in working with, with us and helping us to develop these new techniques and show what our machines can do. And here is just a short selection of all these people. I know I forget somebody but I thank all these people which helped us to provide these nice imaging data. And of course my colleague in absence, Hans Zimmermann, who is a very talented engineer, who provides all these nice images and develops these um, very nice um, new milling techniques together in our microscopy labs. Thank you. Thanks Eric for a really great presentation. Uh, so we have a few questions for you now. Um, if anyone has a question, please feel free to post it in the questions box that appears on the right hand side of your screen. Um, and these will be compiled uh, in a PDF that will be available online with the webinar. Uh, but for now, just a, a couple of questions for you, Eric. What are your recommendations for sample yeah. preparation <clears throat> to acquire the perfect data sets for 3D reconstruction? Sample preparation is always a very, very big issue for electron microscopy and if, if, if you follow the basics of elect transmission electron microscopy sample preparation, you should be fine most of the time. Especially for focus IM beam milling, as you might know, we, we have a complete block surface. If we use TEM images, we have to do post staining of the sections. We can't do that on focus IM beam. Sometimes, not always, it makes sense to 
use slightly longer osmium treatments, for example, to pro provide a bit of better contrast. But as you see also in the cryo samples, you can also provide contrast with nearly nothing on heavy metals included. It depends always on the, on the samples. In general, I can recommend classical TM preparation methods a bit extended on the heavy metal treatments, then you should be perfectly fine. And of course, be aware to have no artifacts within your sample. A typical problem what we see is using old buffer solutions, for example, urinal acetate for too long in the fridge that you get precipitates. The typical embedding problems of air bubbles. Air bubbles are a problem on the focus ion beam side. You can get um, columns built from that because you have an inhomogeneous material. But if you're fine on that, if you have a nice prepared EM sample, you should be fine on, on the focus ion beam side as well. And for, correlate, for array tomography, you can use exactly the same protocols. You can post stay in your sections afterwards. No problems here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, why is low KV imaging so important for biological samples? Low KV imaging is a very important fact, especially if we if we go into correlative. We saw that many many times that. Resins are sometimes different, especially if you use resins which are commonly used in in co correlative microscopy and immunolabeling, like Lovicryl, like Ella White resins. These resins tend to show um, art building artifacts in higher KVs. I had I had really bad experience with that on on TEM tomography, for example. If if you have them too long under the beam, they start to vaporize, and then of course you get an unclear, messy image. And as higher your KV is, you are using as shorter the time is what you where you get really achieve really a nice and coarse image. So that's always a bit of fact of a fact in of the resins. For cryo, it's essential if you go too high in the KV, you simply melt your eyes. So you will see nearly nothing in your sample. It will be melt away within a few seconds if your if your KV is your KV imaging is too high. Okay. Um, next question is uh, which post processing steps are required to achieve the best results for modeling? That depends always a bit on the sample quality or on the sample you are using. What you've seen in, in our, our nice movie of the large brain area, we had to do normally the typical routines are alignment. In some examples, you have a, a, a large drift of samples. You need alignment steps, though so this is the first step you have to carry out. I normally, for our FIP samples, I'm fine with a simple cross correlation. If you are using thicker sections, you might need other um, application um, alignment routines. Image J offers, for example, an, a number of nice alignment tools. We have also um, a nice software reconstru uh, reconstruction software where we work together with this is the so-called ORS and ORS delivers also a number of alignment routines which gives you a smooth and nice um, nice reconstructed sample. On the other hand modeling software is of course another big issue where you have a, a big big choice what can be used from freeware to um, to commercial available software types. Okay. Um, what are your recommendations for modeling and statistical analysis of large volume data sets? For modeling, that's exactly what I said, um, is um, we have um, a number of tools available now, um, especially also the community 
um, one big issue we, we have to say that is of course always the price of a software. If you bought a, a nice expensive machine, sometimes price of licenses for for statistical, for analytic software is difficult to get in the budgets of many scientists. There are a lot of developments out there at the moment. One, one very important um, bit is, for example, um, Elastic, which is a completely free um, segmentation software, which offers you a lot of possibilities in tracking, for example, neurons, which is completely freely available, which has also a nice documentation on YouTube channels. Commercial software is very nice to use. They have very nice segmentation algorithms. I mentioned here in, in our talk, we use quite often this software ORS, ORS, Object Registration Visual, which has nice automated segmentation tools, but also software used in, in light microscopy, such as Imaris provides a lot of um, different segmentation algorithms which can be used for automated segmentation. So there's a number of solutions out there and yeah, basically for everybody you, you, you should find something and with different prices of course. And it depends always what you prefer. Okay, that's wonderful. Uh, that's all we've got time for in terms of questions. Uh, Thank you again, Eric, for a very illuminating presentation and a wonderful discussion. Uh, and thanks all to us, also to our sponsors, uh, Zeiss, for sponsoring this webinar. And finally, thanks to you, the audience, for taking the time to attend and listen in. Uh, if you've enjoyed the seminar or would like to view uh, the video recording of the session, uh, it will be available on our webinars page on Bitesource Bio uh, within the next 24 hours. Uh, if you've got any questions um, that we haven't answered today, uh, you can pop them in the question box now, and we will ensure that all those questions get answered in a PDF that will be available along with the webinar on our website. Um, you can also see all the other webinars that we have lined up for you uh, in Bite Size Buyers Webinar Festival. We have another two this week from Zeiss, so please go check those out. And so until next time, good luck in your research and goodbye from all of us at Zeiss and Bite Size Bio. Thank you.